Hey, so today I want to tell you about a really interesting book called The Detour by Gerbrand Bakker. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce that. He's a Dutch writer, about 50 years old. Um, the Detour actually is a follow-on. I love the cover, by the way. I'm going to tell you more about that in a sec. Follow-on from another book of his called The Twin, which won the Dublin um, Impact Award. This is a really cool thing about publishing, too. I just want to show you that I've got a signed limited edition, which I think, I've never seen this before, where uh, on the back of the book they've, they've numbered it. It's 318 out of 850. Um, this book was translated by David Colmer, and so is the next one. I'd love to tell you who the publisher is of both. It's probably the same company. Um, but in any case, what I want to tell you especially about the detour, um, I already had bought the twin, I haven't read it yet, but um, my friend Michelle Bailat Jones, who I've mentioned before, uh, recommended that our book group read the detour. She has a fascination for strong female characters um, out in nature alone. So I wasn't surprised when this book, um, The Detour, was uh, featuring a heroine in that role. Um, it certainly does not stop there, though. Um, it was a fascinating discussion between uh, the group of us who read this. Um, I have kind of a funky book group. We are um, a variety of nationalities and ages, um, right now all women, but uh, Gerbrand Bakker is a man, and his main character in this novel is a woman, um, who we never see and never are even 100% sure what her name is until the end of the novel. Um, it made for a very interesting conversation. But what I really wanted to talk about first, self-indulgently, was the cover, because I think this design is fabulous. What they've done, um, similar to the novel that I've just published, is a moody gray sky as the background for the um, title, but they've got a bunch of geese that you can see here. Now, geese feature symbolically in the novel. Um, they took a little poetic license, oh, it's vintage, who published it, um, in that there are a lot of geese here, and they seem to have sort of backlit them, so they're a really vibrant white, which is not a match for the story, but it's an absolutely stunning cover. It's one of my favorite um, paperback covers I've seen in a long time. So I wanted to comment on that. Um, I would absolutely recommend it in terms of a book group discussion. Uh, there are a lot of loose ends in the story, which some traditional American readers might find difficult, but uh, I think it makes for a really interesting conversation. So I wanted to say that first of all. And then what I'd like to do is tell you about one thing that I think Gerbrand Backer does beautifully. Um, his, some of his language is absolutely stunning, and I'm sure it starts with him, and it's probably also his translator, David Colmer's um, responsibility for bringing some of this beautiful language to light. But I wanted to talk about something from a writer's perspective, and that is dialogue. Um, I recently was really pleased to hear a compliment about my own fiction that I am um, a skilled writer of dialogue in the way I don't have characters ever quite answering one another, and therefore the plot progresses. Um, I found what I would say is a wonderful example of this, because in any real conversation, each person has their own agenda. And their dialogue, their conversation, their words will be filtered through whatever that agenda is. So in a novel, of course, we have the writer's agenda, Gerbrand Backer's um, message he wants to deliver to the reader, and he uses his narrator. In this case, it's an omniscient narrator, but it's what I'd say is limited omniscient, meaning the narrator knows everything, but really not everything. He doesn't know the future in this case, um, and he doesn't really know the minds of all of his characters. He knows the mind of his protagonist, Emily. So he's limited omniscient, um, but he's close to her, so it's a close perspective. Um, in this scene, Emily, who is ill, has walked a long way to the bakery, where she encounters the baker and his wife, Awen, and I believe it is just those three people who are speaking. Um, and they're speaking about a neighbor whose name is Riss Jones. This takes place in Wales, by the way. Um, and I think if you just hear this, uh, 
exchange of dialogue, you'll see what I'm talking about, where everybody has their personal agendas, including the narrator's agenda, the writer's agenda, and each of the characters' agendas. So take a listen. Um, she's just walked there. When she stepped into the bakery, after a walk that felt like it would never end, she saw that it was quarter to one. On foot, the baker asked. Yes, she answered, out of breath. No distance at all, huh? Nope, here in no time. So we already see she's lying, right? Um, we close at one, just so you know next time. Awen, he's called his wife in from, from the back. The baker's wife emerged from the back. Oh, hello, love, she said. How was the cake? Good. Riss Jones was enthusiastic about it, too. Riss Jones, the baker said. He loves our cakes, Owen said. Are you settling here permanently, love? Now we know her agenda. She just wants this woman to settle down and be permanent. Um, where does he actually live? Near the mountain, that way. The baker gestured through the wall. In late October, he moves his sheep to the old Evans farm. Do you get enough customers here? She was starting to feel hot and took a step to one side under the pretext of looking at something in the glass case under the counter. His wife died, Owen continued, all very tragic, and if she was still alive, she would never let him eat so much cake. We get by, the baker said, gave his wife a sideways glance, as long as people don't buy their bread at Tesco's. So you can see what's happening right there. We've got Emily... Um, we're even told that she's stepping to the side under pretext. So she's lying to them with her physical gestures and with her comments. She's claimed, yes, no distance at all, although we've already been told she's exhausted and it was far. Uh, we can tell that she's not so happy about this Riss Jones character who ate all of her cake. Um, she's now being reprimanded, in a way, by the baker's wife, who says that Riss Jones' wife would not have let Riss Jones eat all that cake. So we see what her agenda is, is sort of to protect her neighbor, to introduce the new woman, Emily, into the neighborhood and make all of that work, while the baker's agenda is to make sure that Emily and hopefully everybody keeps coming into the bakery and not to Tesco in order to buy bread. Um, it's a wonderful exchange of sort of non-synchronized um, conversation. It's not dialogue. It's not just two people talking, which is a little bit harder to... Um, get people to go at cross purposes in their dialogue. But uh, it's just a great example in if you want to deconstruct a conversation and see how to write dialogue. Hope you enjoyed this, and um, I definitely recommend The Detour by Gerbrun Backer if you're interested in a little bit of a mystery and a very interesting short, short novel that uh, you could read pretty quickly and really enjoy. Thanks for watching.